Hi, Chris. How are you? Hello, Hashem. I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very happy to see you. It sounds like this today is a labor day. Ah. That's a problem, so, and maybe many people will not attend. We'll see, we'll see. Okay. If we didn't see many attendant attendees, maybe you can make, make it next Monday. Is it does it work for you? Uh next Monday I'll be uh we'll be traveling, but I should be there. I'm going to go to uh Berlin, but I'll probably be there by that point. Let me see. You can make it anytime, uh, any anytime is good for you. It is nine o'clock and yeah. nobody showed up. Yeah, let me check my flight details. Yeah, uh, yeah. or or or, or, or any time during September. Oh, we got uh, connecting. We got some people. We got Dan. We got Derek. Today is uh, Labor Day. We'll see how many people will get. Hi, Dan. Good morning. How are you, Dan? Good morning. Pretty good. We are not getting many people because today is Labor Day. Exactly. That's yeah. a problem. That's a problem. But it doesn't mean they won't watch it later, right? It, I think this is an important topic. So very, yeah, and I uh, I'm just talking to uh, uh, I'm just talking to uh, our friend, the presenter from PFV, to see if he can postpone it. So so Chris, uh, let, let let us know a good time for you to to ha to, to have this presentation because today. It's Labor Day, and I don't think we'll get many people. Indeed, yeah. Okay, well... You the... choose. You choose. Let me see. Um, we got Paul. Oh, that's good. Oh. Let us see for the next five minutes who's going to attend. And uh, if we don't get enough audience, then we may postpone it. We'll see. I mean, or, or we could do it. It's going to be recorded, right? Just have it recorded and people can watch it offline. Okay. Um, I mean, that's another option. Yeah. Let us see who is going to attend. How are you, Paul? And Derek. Good, thank you. How are you this morning? <laughs> I like your house and your couch. Your mm. office is good. I am used to it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm tuning in to see what you guys want to talk about. And, uh... Yeah. Now we'll talk today about uh, time synchronization in digital twin. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. That's what drew, drew my interest. Yes, we yeah. have a, a product interest in uh, that use case. So yes, excellent, excellent. So, Although I should warn you that the most of my presentation is about uh, mobile communications and the need for synchronization in that. But I do talk about and and also the applications of digital twin uh, as it pertains to mobile communications. Uh, but I, I do. That there are some potential use cases of uh, timing synchronization and digital twin towards the end. So this may be, uh, you know, a, a, an orthogonal uh, attack at the uh, the problem space to what you've been seeing previously. I, I did look, I did review some of the pre previous presentations on, uh, you know, the, the ultra stable clocks and the, yeah. uh, the, the, the these discussions you had. So this is going to be very domain specific, but so uh, I'll try to make, I'll try to relate it as much as I can to the the focus of this this group good 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 let us see maybe wait for a few minutes two more minutes and then we so then you think we can go ahead or was born yeah i'd go ahead i mean i i, mm. I think it's, it's good to just have it and uh you know people can watch it later i mean we, okay you know okay. some of the the videos that we have on youtube right it can be hundreds of people can watch it you know after the the presentation and uh, we will put this on youtube too right oh we'll post the video yeah oh. that, that's the good. whole idea yeah oh, good 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 so wait for about two more minutes and then because i got people who accept, many people accepted actually maybe mm. they accepted without knowing it is right. labor <laughs> then they wake up oh shit, yep. it's labor day 
How many do you normally expect to attend these events? Uh, it depends really on the topic. Like, uh, you know, uh, th this presentation is for a work stream which aim at uh, engaging people from academia and industry to solve or address certain time synchronization issues or problems. But uh, the big OCB tab project, which Ahmed is in charge of, he holds Wednesday meetings every other Wednesday. And that every that meeting may last meeting was attended by 48 people. Uh, for this work stream, we had attendance is uh, between maybe maximum 18 or something because it is specialized to focus on certain problems. And we are we are thinking actually to put all presentation into the Wednesday meetings. This way we can get more attendance because people are already, they have it in their calendar to meet every other Wednesday. We will see, we will see. Uh, so oh, we got Greg, okay. So anyway, I can, we can start and people can join later. So um, our presenter today is uh, Dr. Chris Murphy. He is the CTO of EMEA regional uh, uh, region uh, for uh, for all technologies involved in in uh, that VF is involved in, and uh, I'm sure we'll have a great presentation. He is very well known, and I I send his biography. So without really uh, any further ado, please, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hashem. Mm. Uh, can I check first that everyone can hear me sufficiently, or is anyone having problems with the audio or the uh, the video? Sound good okay. to me. Oh, it's good, good. good. Uh, so I'm showing a, a slide deck here. I'll I'll take you through this. Uh, I'll what I want to do is to talk about the uh, the the need for time synchronization in cellular mobile communication. And some uh, some thoughts on how this has evolved over the years, and and how it's how it's solved in different ways. Uh, I'll also talk then about digital twin, and particularly how it pertains to cellular communications, because that's a, an area of expertise for me. Uh, and then I'll finish off with some thoughts on digital twin and time synchronization, and how the, the two are related together. Uh, so I'd like this to be a a discussion because I'm not. I'm, you know, I know a lot about uh, mobile communications. I don't know so much about, um, well, I know a lot about communications and digital twin as it relates to communications. I don't know so much about the the uh, precise timing and synchronization. So this is a, uh, if this can be a discussion, then I, maybe we'll get more out of it. So, um, yeah, let's, I'll, I'll dive into this anyway. So uh, I work for VRV Solutions and VRV Solutions is a, is a company that makes various products for monitoring, testing, optimizing, and assuring uh, communication networks. So we've got everything from uh, little microscopes that you can use to inspect the ends of fibers before they're installed or after manufacturing so that to make sure they don't have impairments, through to uh, equipment that you can take into the field as a technician if you're installing base stations or installing other communication equipment. Uh, to make sure that the 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 radios are working correctly, that the connectivity is up and it has the right characteristics, uh, or that the, the 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 different channels that are carried are meeting the the requirements of the design. So, uh, and then we've got a, a, some very large cloud-based solutions, which uh, or they're generally on the on the customer premises because it's because of the data volumes involved. Some very large solutions for collecting data from a nationwide mobile phone network to uh, to work out where the performance is good, where the performance is bad, and what the uh, the issues are, allowing those to be root caused. So 
there's a and we also have a, a suite of products in the in the data center field as well as well as the as well as mobile communications and, and fixed line communications so we're a very broad company in terms of uh, the breadth of our portfolio uh but we have we have products in terms in in the space of precise timing particularly for for example to uh to introduce impairments in in the the timing protocols to measure the, re the resilience to that to to measure the uh, the, the implementation of a precise timing network and, and making sure it's working correctly, and also uh, to uh, defeat uh, problems with, for example, GPS-based precise timing uh, to to overcome those. So, for a, quite a broad company, as I say, but I'll, I'll narrow in on some of the uh, the areas which are specific to this, the interests of this group. So. Why is there a need for synchronization and precise timing in cellular communications? Well, at a, a very high level view, that high level as you can get, we've got a in a cellular communication network, we've got these uh, these cell towers which are transmitting and receiving uh, to and from the the mobile phones in a network, and the we have limited amount of spectrum available, uh, so we have to reuse that and we have to manage that carefully so we don't get uh, excessive interference and that we get the, the best capacity we can out of our precious uh, scarce spectral resources <clears throat> so what we can do typically is to is to look at the time domain and we can we can break the time domain into different blocks and we can we can allocate these in in different ways to different users of the network uh, and then we and reuse them as well as uh, over, over 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 the space and also we've got the frequency, uh, we can break the available resources into frequency subcarriers, and we can uh, we can share those out between the different uh, devices trying to use the network. So there are various things that we try to do to, to squeeze the maximum value out of these uh, resources. And uh, I've got a few examples here and I'll take you through these. And these these introduce challenges and, and underpin the, the requirement for uh, precise timing and synchronization between the base stations, for example. So I'll focus on time division duplexing. So in some networks, we have a separate frequency for the uh, the communication from the uh, the base station to the mobile. That's called the down. We call that the downlink. Uh, and then we'd have a uh, a different frequency for the the communication in the ver reverse direction, the uplink. But sometimes we have uh, the situation where we only have a, a, a one frequency band which is used for both. Uh, so we have to use the same frequency resources to transmit from the base station to the mobile and then from the mobile to the base station. Now there's been a lot of research into what they call full duplex, which is the ability to receive and transmit on the same frequencies at the same time. That's not yet a, a thing in commercial networks, but uh, until that time, and uh, maybe we'll get there, until that time we have to to split the resources, we have to uh, to share the the resources, and we so what we do is we take these for, for part of the time we allocate the resources to the downlink, part of the time we allocate the resources to the uplink, and that's uh, that's something which has been done for for many years uh, over the the different uh, the different radio technologies, and it's useful because you don't always have paired spectrum as they call it, where you've got a, a block which is available for the downlink and a block that's available for the uplink. Maybe it's just a single block that's available and it has to be shared in the downlink and the uplink. And also if you're using the same spectral resources, then it means that you can, if you've got a, a network which is needing more of the downlink and less of the uplink, then you can you can flexibly change which of these resources are for the downlink and which are for the uplink. So there's a, there's a need for this. And so uh, what we do is we, we have a in the, in the case that we're transmitting in the downlink. So here's the mobile on the left. It's getting a service from the the base station on the left, and it's transmitting in the downlink. Now, if we didn't synchronize these base stations, then we might find that we get a situation where the mobile on the right is transmitting in the uplink at the same time that the base station on the on the left is transmitting in the downlink. And if these mobiles are close to each other because they're getting towards the edge of the coverage area of these, then you might get the situation that this mobile here is transmitting when this one's trying to receive. And so you get an interference between them. So if you don't synchronize these cells, then the downlink and the uplink transmissions won't line up. 
and you'll get situations of interference like this. And this can really impact your performance and your capacity if you don't get this right. So that's, that's one need for the synchronization. We've also got what's called inter-cell interference coordination. So again, with this example where we've got two mobiles, which I've put towards, they're fairly far from the base stations, but they're fairly close to each other. Um, so that we call them cell edge users. And so if, in order for this base station to transmit to this mobile, it needs to be, it needs to transmit at quite a high power because it's towards the edge of the cell. It's got to go a long way. So it needs to transmit quite loudly to that. If it's transmitting to this base, to this mobile at the same time that this base station is transmitting to this mobile, then you've got the situation where the power being sent to the first phone is experienced as interference by this phone. And the power sent by this base station to this phone is experienced as interference to this phone. So these are undesirable situations. Uh, so what we do is we we can break up the, we can, we can classify mobiles as cell edge and uh, mobiles as, as cell center, and we can treat them differently. So in the case of cell edge mobiles, we can, we can reserve some of the resources in the time domain uh, uh, to the to the cell edge users for this base station, and we can reserve some of the resources uh, for the cell edge users of this base station. And for those mobiles which are closer to the base stations, then they can be they they only the mobiles the base stations have to transmit at a lower power, so it doesn't matter. We can we can use the same spectral resources for them. We only need to discriminate between the the what we call the cell edge users. So this is called inter cell interference coordination. But again. If we don't synchronize the, the base stations, then we will get uh, the, the downlink transmissions to this mobile will start to interfere with the downlink transmissions for this mobile. So another need for synchronization in the, in the mobile networks. And then we've got a whole range of uh, systems and techniques where we can uh, use things like constructive and destructive interference so that we can, for example, uh, transmit signals from multiple base stations to be received by a single mobile or, or multiple mobiles. So not just a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, mobile and base station. Uh, we, can, uh, we can use the same spectral resources. In some situations, we can use the same spectral resources from the same base station to transmit to multiple mobiles or transmit diversity. Uh, so that requires some precise timing because you're relying on the constructive and destructive interference depending on the channel between the, the mobiles. And you've got uh, things like multiple input, multiple outputs, which is a more general term, which in includes things like um, beam forming, where we can shape the beam to, to go in certain directions, depending on where the, where the traffic is. Now, these have uh, much tighter requirements. It's not just about making sure we're not transmitting at the same time and stepping on the toes of another base station. It's about making sure that the, uh, the constructive and destructive interference works properly to get the, the maximum capacity out of the system. And we get some very tight requirements uh, in, in some of these situations down to uh, 12, 12 and a half nanoseconds in some cases. So that's the that's a flavor of why we need precise timing in mobile communications, cellular communications. And typically we've got, uh, we see GPS being used for synchronization and that, that can work very, uh, very well. Um, we can get down to some of the, uh, uh, the precisions that we need for the, the most exotic of, of timing approaches that I've just discovered. Uh, but it's, GPS isn't available everywhere. Sometimes we have indoor base stations and GPS doesn't generally work so well indoors, uh, certainly not deep indoors. Uh, and we've got problems with, uh, with GPS can be jammed. So it's susceptible to jamming or, or just interference or, you know, you're reliant on a, on a, uh, a network, which is a, a dependency and introduces a, a potential vulnerability into your network. So GPS, well, it, it is used pretty commonly in the industry, but there's, there's, there are drives to, uh, to look beyond GPS and, and that sort of approach. So another factor here is disaggregation in cellular communications. So I, I alluded earlier to the, I gave a very simplified view of the, the, the breaking down of the spectral resources into the time domain and into the frequency domain. Well, the reality is a bit more complicated than I, I painted earlier. And we've got, we break down the uh, the 
spectral resources into into what we what we call them frames uh, in, in the case of um, 5G and and LTE 4G for that matter, and we break a frame into two subframes, and each of these each of these subframes has is broken down into slots, each with 14 symbols. So we find that the yeah, one of these symbols, which is a single discrete part of, of transmission is about 70 microseconds. And these need to be lined up between uh, neighboring base stations. Obviously there'll be some propagation effects, but we can take account for that, but we need to have the synchronization to start with so that we're taking account of the right propagation. We've also got in the time, in the frequency domain, we can also break our spectrum up into uh, resource blocks of 12 subcarriers, which are spaced in 15 kilohertz, uh, 15 kilohertz jumps. And uh, we can have uh, pub commercial public carriers can be, well, I think the smallest is about 1.4 megahertz, which gives six of these resource blocks and commercial public networks go to about uh, 15 or 20 megahertz. And there's um, some examples of, of even, even 40, 40 megahertz carriers, which gives us a 100 to 200 resource blocks wide on these carriers. So there's a lot of stuff to, to transmit here. And what the base station is doing is deciding what needs to go, what needs to be transmitted in each of these um, resource elements uh, so that the, the whole communication system works and is, is compliant with the specifications and everyone's getting what they need and receiving what they need and, and it all works according to the specifications and standards. Um, so why do I say this? Well, there's a a long time. There's for a long time. There's been a, a push to disaggregate the actual radio unit, the bits transmitting the 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 RF frequency power from the what we call the baseband. So this is this is like uh, these resource elements are the baseband, which are then modulated onto the carrier. And there's a lot of work has to go into working out what exactly needs to be transmitted, modulated onto each of these resource elements. So there's a lot of compute to be done, and so there's there's for a long time there's been a, uh, a uh, we don't really want to put this baseband processing at the top of a radio tower because there's limited uh, space available, and you need things like um, air conditioning and power and, uh, and and all these and to be able to access it for servicing etc. So not putting it at the top of the radio tower is is a good idea. So for a long time there's been a you put these baseband units at the base of the tower at least and then you've got to have this interface between them um and but as soon as you as soon as you do that disaggregation then you can say well how far can i disaggregate because uh can i can i centralize these baseband units which indeed you can um but there are there are challenges with that and this is where uh cipri comes in at the common public radio interface so this interface here between the baseband units and the radio units is uh, originally based on common public radio interface, CIPRI. Um, it's a, it uses time division multiplexing. It's uh, to interleave the signals for the different, different uh, antennas for different carriers, and it uses constant bit rate. So it, it's synchronization can be easier because you're sending a well-defined uh, communication uh, interface down down the the fiber so synchronization is is easier because the late the latency is is lower is the latency is better and the and the jitter is better um but there are downsides to this and particularly because the you've got the uh each of these resource elements is a modulation of a what we call a in phase quadrature phase constellation so depending on what you're trying to transmit you you combine to carrier waves in phase and quadrature phase together in different amplitudes to give a, a particular, uh, to indicate that a particular value out of 16 options is, is there. So, and this is this is called 16 quadrature amplitude mod modulation, uh, but you can get 64 quam, you can get 128 quam, you can get 256 quam. So it's getting up bigger and bigger. And the problem is that this, you, if you've got, uh, if you're using Cipri, you need to have the capacity to to be able to convey all of the, or we'll deal with the situation that all of these resource elements are being populated, uh, and that means that if you've if you've got uh, if you're not transmitting on all of the resource elements, then you're wasting transmissions. So it doesn't scale. You, you you've got to build it. You've got to you've got to um, build it so that it can support the 
the maximum loading of a particular uh, of a particular base station. So it has a has a downside, um, and there's 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 also a, a desire to you know, take these baseband units away from the the towers themselves and putting them together in more centralized locations, maybe on a metropolitan level, and then you can get the uh, the benefits of uh, sharing the air conditioning and power. Uh, costs of that come down, and you can also, uh, in principle enjoy the statistical multiplexing gain that's not everyone not every tower is transmitting at full full data rate all the time but only if we can get away from cipri and so that's why you know in a nutshell why there's been a move to e cipri enhance cipri so this is this was designed oh another another disadvantage of cipri is it tended to be quite vendor specific so there was there was proprietary aspects of it which made it meant it difficult to to build common solutions for for monitoring and testing these things, but anyway, eCipri has has come along um, with a desire to reduce the bandwidth required for this front hall interface. Um, they've looked again at the different ways of splitting the. You know, we, we got the split between the what happens at the the RF and what happens more centrally, and so eCipri breaks it in a different place from where Cipri breaks it. Uh, so it's more flexible and it's got different options. It's it's open, it's an open interface, so it's interoperable in principle. And it's more cost effective because it moves away from the TDM and it goes to uh, to Ethernet. So we're going packet switched, which, of course, then introduces its own set of challenges because you've then got a uh, packet switch network, which means you've got the, the you, know, you can experience higher latencies and more extreme jitter, which means if you want to synchronize your network, then you've got to take account of that and, and deal with the, the consequences. So the so this this drove the move to uh to go into time sensitive networking as defined by the IEEE. Um and things like uh, um network timing protocol doesn't isn't sufficiently um isn't able to synchronize sufficiently for the needs of the the mobile communication network, certainly not for the the more stringence of the the communication me mechanisms I was talking about earlier. So this this allows us to prioritize time critical data so we can make sure that those uh, the, the data that needs to be transmitted urgently is able to get through as long as we've got sufficient capacity and we have to provision for that, uh, design our network accordingly, preserving the 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 uh, the real-time data streams if yeah, we've got um, timing information, then we need to know, know that we can measure the round trip time reliably and accurately without packet delays getting in, in the getting in the way and causing synchronization problems. And it also gives us things like fault tolerance uh, through redundancy. So we've got a, this is very good for mobile networks, which SIPRI is not so good at. And so it uses, uh, it needs time synchronization of the clocks across the network. And this uses the precision timing protocol as defined by the IEEE 1588 specification. And in fact, um, it doesn't actually, it, it, it defines profiles for different classes of uh, communication network on top of uh, 1588. So this this is a, this enhanced CIPRI is a, is a move forward and it means it can be, um, yeah, the, the mobile communication networks can be lower cost because you can build it on ethernet, packet switch networks, we get the advantage of statistical multiplexing and we get the advantage of being able to to centralize our our baseband unit in a in a in a in a flexible way but of course this this timing um this <clears throat> time sensitive networking is used in a, a number of areas and it goes to uh, power utilities financial trading good example and industrial automation so this is a uh, something which is being used across many industries um something we come across in our, in our work is the, the move to simple or the, uh, the initiative of simple type precision time protocol. So precision time protocol is is quite chatty and uh, and it has some overheads which you don't need in a in a data center where you've got a trusted environment, for example. So you don't need you, you can do away with authentication and uh, things like that if you if you're in a trusted environment of a data center. So there's been some push by uh, Meta, for example, to to go beyond this to a much more simple uh, exchange protocol for uh, for the simplified uh, PTP. Um, so this is something which is gathering momentum at the moment, as I understand. 
So that's a very brief introduction to mobile communications and why we need synchronization and precise timing and some of the approaches uh, like uh, CIPRI and eCIPRI and time sensitive networks and precision timing protocols of how that's achieved. So I'd now like to move on to digital twin. And this will this is a bit of a uh, different section. So let me let me start on this. So what well, what is a digital twin and, and particularly as it relates to, to mobile communication? So um well there's a lot of opinions on this and there's a, there's a lot of work going on and and uh, one question that tends to pop up is, is what's the difference between a simulator and a digital twin? So I've I've thought about this and this is my personal opinion and I, I welcome uh, pushback on this or, or uh, ideas and thoughts on this this way of thinking of the world. So we can think of a, a simulator as as a, a model of a of something which may exist in real life. Digital twin tends to be uh, relate to something which does exist in real life. We can have a simulator of something which is is a, in principle existing or, or or doesn't even it doesn't actually exist. So let's uh, let's start there. We've got a, a continuum from simulated digital twin. So so we could we could uh, build a simulator based on a a topology and a configuration of a of a a network in this case or anything any physical system that we might be interested in. So we could, in principle, we can collect data from a database of a, the mobile network. What's in the database about the configuration? What's in the database about the, the topology? Where are the sites located? How are they how are they constructed? Um, assuming that the database is correct, because if someone has built a physical network, then it doesn't always correspond to the, the database. But uh, uh, that's another another aspect which we can you know, we can consider um, as we go. As we go along a bit, maybe we, we can introduce models for our environment. So uh, 3GPP is what defines the the standards and specifications for the the the, the 4G, 5G, and that's coming will be coming along 6G networks. Uh, so they've got they define various models for um, for the, uh, the the propagation environment. So the, um, the how does the signal propagate through space in different types of environment for for example, from urban, there's, there's the urban macro for a macro cell in an urban environment, so urban micro, um, indoor environments, indoor cells for you know, things like uh, shopping malls and things like that. Uh, so it also defines models for the, the channel. So the statistical channel model defined by 3GPP. And they've also got extended um, uh, typical urban and extended uh, typical rural um, for the different types of channels. So um, maybe we can also model the, the way the subscribers move and interact with the system. And we've got pedestrian models and we've got vehicular models defined by 3GPP. So, so we could in principle take these uh, analytical models and we can use them in our, in our simulator. And if, we, if we've chosen them wisely, then our simulator starts to uh, mimic a little bit better the, the physical system that we've got. Um, then we can start to talk about measurements of the network. You know, we've, we've already collected data from the database, but what about measurements about how it's actually operating and how it's actually, uh, how things are actually happening in the network? Uh, so we can, uh, we, I call them retrospective measurements because there's typically always a latency between a measurement being collected and it being able to be used in a, in a, in a model. Um, and so we can think about collecting from the data from the base stations themselves, as well as the, the, the database, which doesn't just contain configuration, but it might, might contain um, a telemetry from the network. Um, so indirectly, the, the base station information comes to us through the, uh, through the, the, the databases or, or could be streamed from the base stations themselves. And often the mobiles are making measurements about their environments and in, information about what mobiles, what cells they're using. So we can collect this information and use it to make make models. And because it takes a while for the data to be collected and uh, the measurements to be made and the data to be gathered and aggregated and uh, made available to, to models, that it tends to be re retrospective because there's some latency involved. But we can also, so th this means if we if our desire is to build a, a mimic of a, of a system which exists as it exists now, because it will be very dynamic in a case of a mobile network, then there, there will generally be a latency involved, but we don't have to stop there because we can we can think about the 
you know, making the lace, making the measurements ever more uh, low latency as we, particularly for the ones that are most important for the, the models that we're putting into our digital twin. Uh, and ultimately, we can even make prospective measurements. We can we can use machine learning to to anticipate what will happen in the future. And if we can anticipate the state of our physical network in the future, then we can open the doors to be able to do more things. So that's a, some thoughts on digital twin and what it means, uh, particularly in the context of mobile communication. But I think there are uh, there are some uh, nuggets here which would would apply to other domains as well. So. So what is a digital twin in another sense? I mean, what, and in the, in the sense of what can we do with it? Uh, so I'll try to define it, but uh, let's think about some ways we can use it. So we can think of our mobile network over on the right-hand side here with base stations and, and mobiles, and there are other components of the network, not least the, the things like the baseband and the all the other processing, which, which makes it work, because there's a, a core network I haven't really talked about. Uh, all these things need to fit together to, to deliver the mobile network. But we can focus on the what we call the radio access network, the radio aspects of it. And I call them E2 nodes here because this is what they're called in, in what's called, um, uh, it's defined by the, uh, the ORAN Alliance, the Open RAN Alliance, uh, which is defining a, uh, it's trying to, to solve the problem of making the, the networks more interoperable, more decomposed into different components, which gives various advantages for operators. Um, Anyway, so we can think about uh, different ways, different aspects of a digital twin, different dimensions of a digital twin, and we can think about the, the configuration of the uh, the models, or uh, well, the configuration of the network, and we can model that. So we can, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we can look in the databases and collect the, the parameters of the, the, the different components of the system and the topology, which uh, will, you know, can be static, uh, there can be aspects which are dynamic as well. Uh, we can think about... Um, the, the radio propagation and the, the the channel modeling that we I talked about earlier, as well as how the network functions behave. And uh, we can aspire to build models for these and put them into our digital twin. Um, and we can think about the uh, the UE locator. How are the, I've talked about UEs. UE stands for user user equipment. So it's the, what we call the mobiles in the, in the telecommunication industry. So uh, we've got the, the locations of the mobiles and, yeah, well, how are they, uh, where are the geographical, what's the geographical distribution, where are their high concentrations, where are their low concentrations, and uh, what sort of services and applications are the mobiles trying to use? This will affect how the mobile network is used. So these are things that, these are models that we can build, which give us an output. So we can, if we build these models, then we can, we can interrogate the model and say, well, what is the state of my system? Uh, in, under certain circumstances. But we don't just want to have an output, we want to have a two-way. We want to be able to say, what happens if I, in certain scenarios, if certain scenarios of, of congestion, what happens if there's an impairment to my network? What happens if something, if a connection goes down or if there's interference building up because of some external, external phenomenon that we haven't uh, taken account of? And what happens if we want to expand our network? So we can, we can also we also have to be able to have inputs into our digital twin uh, in order to see what the effects on the outputs will be, and so these inputs will be you know, for everything from uh, the as I say the impairments and the uh, the subscriber behavior. Maybe there's a change in the subscriber behavior because of a special event. Uh, maybe there's um, some optimization going on because there's intelligence built into these networks so they can adapt to the uh, to the stimulus on the network from the subscribers, from the uh, the environments, from any impairments that are taking place. So it's a very dynamic system. So we need to be able to respond to these and, and take inputs into our digital twin. <clears throat> I mentioned Nitro because uh, this is a, a product in our portfolio which does uh, collect data from the mobile networks and does a lot of analytics on it. So it estimates the location of where the demand is and where the coverage is good, where the coverage is poor, where there's high interference, where there's uh, where there's congestion and, and other other adverse effects taking place. So there are there are solutions to to start to close the loop with the, with a live network. So in a network, I, I want to talk about how we then use the digital twins in the in the mobile networks. So yeah, we got typically 
a number of stages in our in our network life cycle. Uh, the the manufacturers of the mobile networks, the, uh, the network equipment manufacturers, they have a a research and development cycle. So they're developing things in the lab and they're making sure that the uh, as they lab test them that they're they're up to up to to scratch that they're able to uh, you know, work and deliver the performance required. You've then got a, a deployment stage where operators are deploying the, the the solutions into the field, and then you've got an operational phase. Um, so I'll just talk about these different phases now. So um, in the in the lab stage, or we we've got, for example, we've got this network intelligence I talked about. So there there are uh, agents in the network which are able to to monitor, detect certain adverse events or particular phenomena taking place and, and respond to these to to achieve better performance, more resilient networks and, and saving energy, for example. So in traditionally, if we want to test the networks in the lab, we want to make sure that the interfaces are uh, conformance to the specifications and the standards, uh, that there, there's conformance uh, between these uh, uh, between the uh, there's different entities defining the how these things work, including 3GPP and the RAN Alliance. So, conformance to their specifications and standards is important. We also want to make sure that the networks work under load. So, can we load them up, and do they have failure modes in under, under loaded conditions, and can they interoperate? So, can we take a vendor A and a vendor B, or even two components from the vendor from the same vendor, and make sure that they do work together properly under these different circumstances? So, this is what we do in lab tests. This is kind of the the foundational lab testing. But when we got a digital twin, what happens? So, with the digital twin, we can, can compare these uh, these agents which are uh, performing the the network intelligence. Uh, making decisions about how to reconfigure the network to respond to, to changes and stimulus on the network and impairments. Uh, we can uh, compare two different, two different agents from the same vendor or from different vendors and uh, see which one works better, which gives us better outcomes in terms of energy use and performance. We can, uh, we can validate that the apps are able to uh, as a system, if you put multiple apps together from on the same system from maybe from different vendors that they don't have adverse interactions that we need to be aware of. So a digital twin allows us to do this much more in much more realistic scenario than we could just with a a, a, a simulator and um, a, a simpler test harness because we've got a more accurate representation of what these will have to be in, encountering in the field. So that's how I see the lab test being enhanced by Digital Twin. We can also think about the deployments. So uh, traditionally in deployments, we might do, uh, as, as we're building our system ready to go out into the field, we might do unit tests, regression tests, system tests, and load tests. If we've got a Digital Twin, we can also uh, test the performance. Again, you know, we've done a, a thorough job in the lab, but as new versions of software get released, we don't want to just trust that, they're, that the performance is going to be the same as before. So we can do testing on the, uh, the, the performance that results from this, results from changing components of our system as new versions are released. And we, in some cases, some of this intelligent agents will learn from their environment. Uh, so as they go out into the field, then we'd expect some ramp up time as they encounter different scenarios in that particular environment and they adapt to that. Well, in that situation, we might find that we've got a ramp up time, which means that we're not running at full optimal capability for a, a period of time. So in that situation, having a digital twin gives us the opportunity that we can pre-train our intelligent agents before they get into the field so that they can be uh, running nominally and at full performance much sooner than they would do otherwise without digital twin. So that's the deployment stage, the, some of the deployment examples of digital twin. Digital twin. When, when the network is operational, it's out in the, out in the field and uh, it's actually delivering a service to real subscribers, then, well, what are the applications of uh, basic operations? I say basic, and some of these things are very sophisticated and they're built up over decades, but uh, without digital twin, shall we say, 
uh, we've got performance management. You know, do we can we measure the performance of our network, and can we uh, detect anomalies? Can we uh, make sure that uh, service level agreements are met? So we can we make sure that our subscriber base is is happy enough that with our service that we're they they're going to stay with us? Um, can we detect faults and anomalies and respond to those? And there's a concept of self-organizing networks, which uh, it tends to be kind of fairly localized decisions which are made in response to uh, certain uh, phenomena which can be detected. With digital twin in the field, we can we can think about the ongoing training of these intelligent applications. Some intelligence applications may, may depend on things like reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning needs to be able to test the bounds of where it can go. It needs to be able to test the bounds of how far can you go before things start to break and degrade. You don't want to do those exploratory tests on the live network, but doing this on the digital twin could well be a, a, a very beneficial a very beneficial option for avoiding adverse effects, whilst also allowing exotic uh, optimization techniques such as reinforcement learning to, to be able to be practical. Um, there could be conflicts between different agents in the network. They may want to, one may want to do one thing, one may want to do the other. To arbitrate between those, you might want to uh, introduce a, an, a digital twin as an arbiter between conflicts, or even just to decide whether a proposed change by an agent is is sensible or or not. Uh, so the, the gate, gatekeeper use case, I see that as. So these are applications of digital twin in the live network as I see them. And then even in the planning stage, uh, planning is is the if you want to expand your network, you may have to decide where to place your infrastructure, where to place new base stations, which base stations to expand with new infrastructure, new carriers, new frequencies, new technologies. So in the traditional case, then we're, we're as I say, choosing locations of sites and the, the configurations ready so we can roll out parameterizations before we uh, turn the network on uh, and making sure that we can achieve the coverage that we want. Well, with the digital twin, we can go further than that. We can we can say, well, not only do I am interested in, can I meet the coverage requirements? Can I serve the traffic that I have, uh, that I have the desire to serve now? But what about in the future? I want to have a network which is as flexible as possible. So meeting the requirements I've got now, but it's very flexible for future services that I probably haven't even thought of yet and haven't been invented yet. So how flexible is my network? With the digital twin, you can you can pose the the question of how how flexible would I be to be able to, to serve different types of traffic, different types of different concentrations of users with different behaviors and different applications with different uh, characteristics of the quality of service. So I, I see a potential application of digital twin, digital twin even at the planning stage. <clears throat> so in summary, this is the my view on the digital twin applications in, in mobile communications. So that's my that closes my second part of my my presentation, and I've got one further slide, which is on the bringing the, the two sides together. So we talked about the we talked about the need for precision timing uh, uh, in, in mobile communications, and then digital twin and what it can be used for, and with a particular focus on mobile communications. But what happens if we bring these together? Well. Clearly, if we've got a digital twin, which involves components which are needing precise timing, then we can use the existing precise timing uh, mechanisms such as eCIPRI, such as time-sensitive networking and PTP in order to achieve the synchronization within the digital twin. This is something which is, I would say, in its infancy at the moment, because I, uh, the, you know, the industry is very interested in digital twin, but I'm you know, we're not seeing so much on the on the need to synchronize these things. But I'd also ask the question, so so, yeah, so in summary, for that part of things, you can say, how can precise timing bring value to digital twin? In and I think that's uh that's something which will which will evolve over over time. Uh, but it will generally depend on some of these techniques that we've already seen in in the the live networks. But another question we can pose is what about in the applications of um of the uh the the, you know, the the actual end user the vertical applications mobile communication 
smart factories, power grid management and scientific experiments, for example. So can we can we use digital twins to characterize the signatures of uh, particular impairments or, or attacks? So if we can do that, we can if we can introduce use digital twin in order to uh, mimic the uh, the effect of so digital twin to represent our physical system, maybe in, in this case, the mobile mobile communication network and use a um, simulate an impairment on the precise timing in order to understand our, uh, you know, how will that, if we had an impairment to our precise timing, if there was a, a synchronization problem, uh, can we can we quantify the impact on say the performance of the mobile network based on the degree of severity of that loss of synchronization? Because this is something that we can put on a continuum and you know, if the synchronization gets so bad, then it can be, it can bring the system to its knees and means it's not going to work. But it's not typically; it won't fall over immediately. There'll be in the in the mobile network, as the synchronization is lost, then there'll be an impact on the performance. There'll be an impact on the capacity. There'll be impact on the interference. But things will still work, and it will only be once you reach a certain point that the uh, the the problem will be so severe that the, the system will will cease to to operate in a in a anything like an adequate way. So we can. With a digital twin and creating the uh, the conditions of a loss of synchronization, we can first of all characterize what do these situations look like. How do I know if I've lost synchronization to uh, if the synchronization is is lost to um, so it's now five hundred nanoseconds out of out of sync? What does that look like? How can I how can I detect that using a machine learning model, for example? I see that as one one area of interest, which uh, which uh, could be very fruitful. And then there's also the uh, the mitigations. So if there is a loss of synchronization, can the network, yeah, the, can the network respond to some limited amount of loss of synchronization in a way so that it stays healthy for longer, even in the presence of that? So we can first of all detect the problem, and secondly, we can respond to it to mitigate it whilst the loss of synchronization is is um, is responded to, and I see that having applications in in the the communication networks, five G networks, and then six G networks are starting to be um, in the early stage of development. So that's going to be, and they're, they're very ambitious in terms of what we will do with those six G networks. So I, I anticipate timing will become ever more important. Uh, but we can also think about examples in, for example, smart factories where the uh, the different components of a smart factory need to work together in with very tight timing tolerances and and if we start to lose that we don't want to discover it because something has broken some physical piece of kit is broken we'd like to be able to spot the the signatures of the loss of synchronization early enough so we can shut things down before things are broken uh, and and also to understand the root cause where where is that loss of synchronization which piece of equipment has has uh, Sub been subject to the loss of synchronization and very quickly work to fix it. So we get the factory up and running again very quickly. And similar arguments with, with apply in power grid management, I think, where it's important to understand if a if a some if a piece of kit goes down, um, then it's it, it, the signature of that failure might may be more easily diagnosed and and identified and and uh, isolated. If we've got good precise timing between the between the the nodes in the network and the sensors in the network, but what happens if we start to lose that? How how bad does it have to get before we would be unable to isolate these problems with sufficient speed in order to avoid a major outage? And scientific experiments, I think you think about something like CERN must be an incredible a system to try and coordinate and synchronize. And uh, I think there's digital twins of CERN would be a fascinating thing to work with and understand how the how the, the experiments would would succeed or fail based on the uh, the degree of synchronization. So that's my presentation. So in summary, yes, mobile communication networks do depend on uh, precise timing in many ways. Uh, and we solve that and we have continue to develop ways to solve that and, and deliver that so could deliver the, the best capacities and performance from our networks. Digital Twin is getting a lot of interest. 
not least in mobile communications. And there are many potential applications and current applications, to digital twin and communication networks and wider than that. And if you bring them together, we find some very interesting use cases for precise timing and digital twin. So that's my presentation. So I'm very happy to take questions or discussions. Well, we have about six minutes left. If anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead. I have a question. So please, um, if you look at uh, precise time, right? Everybody, you know, you had that class A, B, C, and A plus. Um, could you use the digital twin to see, hey, if I improve precision uh, by this much, what the performance impact, you know, the important improve performance improvement would be? Absolutely, I think so, yes. I mean, I, I talked in terms of measuring the impact of degraded performance, but we could also ask the question, well, what happens if I upgrade my uh, transport network uh, so I'm able to uh, achieve those higher degrees of uh, performance? Would I see a, a, a knock-on effect on the performance that the, the mobile subscribers experience? Very good question, right. yes, uh, I think so. And the reason I ask is because, you know, a lot of times I've, you know, pushed for, you know, sub nanosecond precision and people are like, we have no justification for sub nanosecond precision. But if you were to use, say, your digital twin here to say, hey, if we went to, you know, you know, 500, you know, picoseconds, you know, the benefit would be this, you know, but if we went to 40 picoseconds, the benefit would be that. And you could justify, you know, based off of, you know, your digital twin, where exactly you know, the cutoff is, maybe it is tens of nanoseconds is the best, you know, throughout the network or something like that. Um, but I think a lot of times people, you know, just don't see the benefit of going super precise. And, you know, maybe that's, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's, this is a way to justify, hey, you know, 10 nanoseconds of precision, that's good enough. Let's, you know, let's worry about some nanosecond, you know, 10 or 15 years down the road, or it might say, wow, guys, the digital twin showed this benefit that, you know, hey, sub nanosecond, if you had it today, you know, you could get 2x performance benefit or something. I don't know. Um, hmm. But I, I, I think that would be interesting. I think ultimately, yes, yeah, so that's a really good observation. I, I think ultimately, you, you can build a digital twin, which is as as faithful as you as you need in, in the in the dimensions you need. I talked about different dimensions of digital twin, you don't need to model those bits that are not relevant to your problem. So you might build a, a very faithful simulator of the uh, MIMO adaptation in, in radio. And you can say, well, if, if I can achieve this level of synchronization, then I can um, I can get more capacity through. Well, right. uh, well, I can quantify that increasing capacity, but if that capacity is, is you know, if there, are other, if there are other aspects of the channel uh, in, the, in the propagation environment you're actually gonna go into, which means that you can't achieve those MIMO adaptations, then that's that's going to stop you anyway. Or it may be that your network isn't doesn't need that level of MIMO adaptation just because of the way it's being used by the subscribers. Maybe they're maybe they're higher speed subscribers in reality, and they they can't you know, enjoy that the, the highest levels of MIMO adaptation. So you know all these different questions come together and to make the the reality of the system that you're you're dealing with and and uh, yeah, localized academic questions about. MIMO adaptation in in the presence of certain channel conditions don't actually relate to your real system at all. Yeah, very interesting. The other aspect that I thought about is designing the next generation, right? You talked about if I incorporate this person or this vendor's equipment into my network, what would happen, you know, but <clears throat> could you look at it in terms of, you know, I have these vectors that I could improve on my next generation product, uh, which vectors do I get the most bang for the buck, right? And so that, that that's another way that, you know, I, I looked at this is you have this model of your telecom system. And, you know, if I wanted to do 6G and I, you know, maybe, you know, I'm just throwing out something like beamforming, maybe there's a lot more benefit in beamforming than there is in precision or vice versa. And so, uh, yeah, I this is what was... I was trying to capture in this yeah. in this case here. The planning the network, you can you can say, well, I want to serve. You know, I know today I've got this population of subscribers I'd like to serve. Mm -hmm. um, so where do I put my sites in order to serve them today? But you can ask, how do I get my bang for my buck, the most bang for my buck in terms of a very flexible network in the future? Maybe putting right. 
a new carrier here would be more advantageous because this gives me more room for growth and exactly. serving delivering new services than if i put it here so yep. yes absolutely that's a really good really good way of, of thinking about digital twin thank you yeah but uh have a question uh, uh when you do time synchronization is it synchronization between the digital and physical components or between the digital components in the uh, digital yeah. twin it's that's a that's a good question so i thought about what well, yeah how do we bring precise timing into the digital twin so that the components of the digital twin are synchronized you're right uh but you're you're saying well can we actually have synchronization between the digital twin and the physical components that's a really good question mm -hmm. and i yeah i the applications of that could be could be very interesting um because, yeah, no, I, I'm I'm going to. I need to think about that. That's a that's a, a an interesting challenge because we get yeah, as we're trying to build the, we're trying to lower the latency of importing data into the digital twin so that we're as close as possible, representing the uh, the, the physical system. Um, but do we achieve anything by having synchronization between the digital twin and the physical system? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I'm sure there'll be some use cases for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, not immediately thinking of them. Sure. Anyway, uh, we are at the top of the hour now. Thank you very, very much, uh, Chris, for your excellent presentation. And uh, I think you discussed very good topics for further research. And uh, we are having more digital twin presentations as part of this work stream. So hopefully we can address some of these issues that you mentioned uh, in these other presentations. So thank you very much and thanks for everybody who attended despite that, the fact that today is Labor Day. So uh, thank you very much and I hope you enjoy your day. And thanks again, Chris. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, Hashem, and thank you for the uh, interesting questions and for listening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.